Thank you. Aloha. Yeah, I, I come from Maui via Boston, and uh, so I'm a little bit confused as to what time it is or where I am, but, uh, but I'm not confused about strokes. Uh, I work in uh, Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, and we see someone with a stroke every single day, and strokes can be very tragic. So the goal of this talk today is so that none of you will get a stroke. At least we can reduce your risk dramatically. And I know a lot of people here are already healthy and doing a lot to reduce your risk of stroke, but maybe we can do a little bit more. Uh, in America, strokes are the number four killer. Number one's heart disease, and we have cancer, and Alzheimer's number six. And I work with Alzheimer's. I have a clinical trial going on to stop Alzheimer's disease with nutrition. This is very unusual. All our other research projects at the clinic are with drugs, but this one is pitting food against Alzheimer's disease. It's underway and uh, it seems to be working, so I'll keep you posted next year on how it's going with that. Yeah, it's amazing. We, we saw one patient um, every month for about a year and she changed her diet. She came to us with Alzheimer's disease in a wheelchair and a year later, she walked up to the front of an auditorium and spoke to our group of doctors and read a testimonial that she said, you know, I'm able to read medical journals now. And isn't it a coincidence that she gave up dairy and her headaches and coughing went away? Maybe not such a coincidence after all. Uh, so what, every 42 seconds, somebody has a stroke in the U.S. Um, and of course, the hard part about strokes is that it can lead to disability. Now, little tiny strokes, TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, those sometimes don't lead to any problems, but they're a warning sign that you might get another stroke. But a lot of times you see people, if they're lightly touched by a stroke, just with some drooping on one side of the face and some difficulty speaking. And, of course, then strokes can range to wheelchair-bound or lack of memory or even dead. So it's a really good thing to avoid. And it's especially nice for those who love you because if you were to get a bad stroke, you might need a lot of care day and night and just wonderful not, not to do that to yourself or to anyone else. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, uh -oh. my clicker seems to be a little bit slow. Wait, now it's coming. So these are the worldwide causes of death. Number one, heart attacks. Number two, strokes. So worldwide, this whole thing is going on. What do you think? Food has a lot to do with it, a huge amount. Now, a lot of doctors disagree with me when I say stroke is not genetic. But really, it's transferred through the dinner plate more than the genes. If you look at the bottom of Florida there, you see white, which means a low incidence of stroke. And then in northern Florida, you see very dark, which means a lot of incidence of stroke, data from the CDC. So the racial mix isn't different. The genes aren't different, but what people eat is different. So that's, that's really the big thing with strokes. You should know the warning signs. Uh, first of all, if the face is uneven, there's a weak arm or leg, and if speech is strange, then modern drugs can do a lot within a short period after the stroke. So if you know someone having a stroke, get them to medical care immediately. In this case, drugs are the right thing because they can really help reduce the amount of damage. It's called infarct area, infarct size. Infarct is the area that has been starved of oxygen and nutrients. A small stroke, as the arrow is pointing to, can be a warning sign. Now, there are two types of strokes, ischemic, which means plugged artery, and hemorrhagic, which means bleeding in the brain. The ischemic kind makes up 85% of strokes, so that's really the common kind. Both types of strokes result from arterial disease, and arterial disease is something that is caused by diet. We can do a lot about it. If you get a, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, or a little stroke, consider yourself lucky and warned that you don't want to go ahead and get another one because once you've had a stroke, 
your chances of getting a second stroke might be nine times as much or 15 times as much. And remember, that's as much as something that strikes every 40 seconds throughout America. So even the normal risk of stroke is too high. But the interventions that I'll talk about today can lower your risk of stroke even more than that. This is an example of a big stroke. The white area was starved of oxygen and nutrients for a period of time, and that section of the brain died. And you can see why it's often one side of the body or the other, because it's often one side of the brain or the other. The arterial supply is a little different on each side. This is a pretty scary picture, but hopefully it will inspire you to, uh, well, just eat a little bit better. That's a hole burned in the brain by a stroke. And that's exactly what we don't want, and that's why I'm working with you today to help you to avoid this kind of situation. If that is in a memory area, you might lose a lot of memory. If it's in a motor area, you might lose the ability to walk. So it just depends where in the brain the damage occurs, what kind of damage it will be. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke, as I mentioned, is bleeding in the brain, and this is also very dangerous and needs immediate medical attention. Healthy arteries aren't as likely to break as unhealthy ones. So I'll talk a lot about how to make them healthy. Also, since I work with dementia, I also have developed dietary protocols for epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. For ALS, I'm working on multiple sclerosis now. So there's a lot of neurologic diseases that I'm developing nutritional profiles and protocols to help with. Stroke can increase the risk of dementia nine times. And uh, so that's another good reason to find out how not to get a stroke. You'll notice at the bottom of this page and most of the pages coming up, there's a citation. In this case, it's Lancet Neurology 2009. And all of my information comes from peer-reviewed medical journals. It does not come from websites, from newspapers, from books that other authors have written. It only comes from the original studies. And then I look over those original studies very carefully to make sure that the people writing the study know what they're talking about and are doing a good job and they're not biased or sponsored. So you can control high blood pressure. Well, that can really increase your risk of stroke six times if you have high blood pressure. So of the people we see in the clinic, most of them are over 60 and many are over 70. And I would say maybe 80 or 90% are on high blood pressure drugs. So it's very, very common for Americans to have high blood pressure, and, and that's because of the diet that Americans eat. It's not so common to find whole food vegans with high blood pressure, especially if they're athletic. So there's a clue to that one. High cholesterol is a big risk factor because, after all, it's high cholesterol that leads to the clogging of the arteries. And once the arteries are clogged with plaque, if a piece of that plaque were to break away and get lodged in a brain artery, then that could cause a stroke. Another way it happens is a piece of plaque can break away in a heart artery or another artery and move up into the brain and cause a stroke. So one of the keys is not having your arteries filled with plaque, and cholesterol indicates plaque levels to a certain extent. Diabetes is really common, and um, if you know someone with diabetes, I think I might have a video or two left uh, on diabetes. I have a reversing diabetes program based on Brenda Davis's program in the Marshall Islands, which was very successful. And then, of course, being slim really helps lower your risk of a stroke, so we can all work on that. It's, it's not easy in a country where food is junky, cheap, tasty, and convenient. So we have to all be a little bit strong and avoid those foods and eat the healthy, tasty, sometimes inconvenient foods. <laughs> Alcohol and smoking increase risk quite a bit, um, so anything other than a small amount of red wine would be considered risk elevating for, for the strokes. And by the way, the pictures here, this picture is uh, avocado, 200 calories, and this is a fast food hamburger, just half of one, 200 calories. So you can choose with your fork which one you want to eat. One side has healthy fats and one side has unhealthy fats, and I don't think I need to say which side that is. But one in three U.S. adults has high blood pressure. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's like 100 million people. Uh, well, no, actually, it's what? 67 million people. 
eight out of every 10 people having their first stroke have high blood pressure. This is a study led up by Mosaferian, a Harvard researcher who's excellent. If you see any paper with his name on it, it's likely to be well done. So how do we stop high blood pressure? Well, the first thing would be to lower... Oh, well, yeah, this is interesting. A recent double-blind placebo-controlled study showed that an ounce of ground flaxseed daily lowered systolic, that's the higher of the two numbers, of blood pressure by 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Oh, that's quite a change. I mean, that might be a 10% drop just with the addition of flaxseed powder which is really healthy for you in a couple other ways. Alpha-linolenic acid, the hard-to-get omega-3 is also in flax seeds. So this is something that anyone can do. Uh, if you know perhaps a relative who is in danger of having a stroke and they don't want to change their diet, maybe you could get them to at least add some flax, lower that blood pressure a little, and reduce risk somewhat. So here's how to get a stroke, or not. The first step is that oxidize LDL. You know LDL is low-density lipoproteins, and they're called bad cholesterol. They're little carriers that allow a fatty substance to move in our watery bloodstream. They're not necessarily bad, but when they're oxidized, then they can stick to the side of an artery wall, and they do all the time in people. Then they're engulfed by macrophages, foam cells build up, calcium and cholesterol deposits occur, and you get that plaque that lines arteries like the bad side of this picture. On the other hand, uh, that isn't inevitable as people grow old, and if you do have plugged arteries, like up here where it's, it's really getting small, occluded, if a flap of that plaque were to break away, it could then lodge in an artery in your heart, causing a heart attack when clotting factors build up around it. Or in your brain, it could clog up an artery, causing a stroke when the clotting factors build around it. So strategy one is let's reduce the amount of plaque we have and build. And strategy two, let's keep the blood thin enough so it doesn't aggregate so easily that it will cause a stroke. So how do we lower blood cholesterol to lower arterial plaque? Well, obviously, you need to eat less animal foods from beef, pork, chicken, and cheese. I analyze diets with my own software called The Diet Doctor, and I look at where people get their saturated fats. It makes all these nice graphs for me so I can see. And I show that to people as a learning tool, and you can do it yourself, too. It's really good to do it yourself because when people tell me their diet, they always leave out the Snickers bars, you know, the cake and all the unhealthy stuff that they know I don't want to hear about. Um, but when you do it yourself, then you can put in everything and get a, a more realistic assessment of, of what you got. Uh, eat more vegetables, fruits, beans, and seeds. These plant foods have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant factors that are really good for health. Now, I mentioned oxidized LDL. Well, if it's protected by vitamin E from nuts and seeds, then it's not very likely to get oxidized because the vitamin E protects the LDL. It's a fat-soluble nutrient. Actually, has a little fatty nose that sticks into the external shell of the LDL and protects it against oxidation. Vitamin C is essential for keeping the vitamin E working on a continuing basis. So their vegetables and fruits have lots of vitamin C, and the nuts have vitamin E, and they all work together. Exercise is really crucial. Uh, do we have any bicyclers in the crowd today? Great. How about runners? Okay, who likes to work out in a gym? Okay, well, everybody, please get all the exercise in a gentle, gradually increasing fashion that you can. And I'll try and take that advice, too. Um, it's a real good idea because it keeps your cardiovascular system healthy and it burns up extra fats, and extra fats aren't a real good idea. Uh, there's also, I mentioned phytosterols from nuts and seeds. I'll mention phytosterols a little bit more as I go on. These are components in nuts and seeds that lower our cholesterol, so a real good thing. Who's heard of cholesterol crystals? Anybody heard of cholesterol crystals? Okay, good, a few people have. Most people haven't heard of those. If you get an excess 
of cholesterol in your bloodstream, just a, a big wash of cholesterol through your bloodstream, the cholesterol can actually start crystallizing because it's so saturated. And the crystals have been found to poke through. You can see in the picture, they're razor sharp and they poke through the plaque and break it away. So we've been wondering what is the final event that causes the plaque to break away? Now, how would you get a cholesterol bomb in your arteries? What, what food would you eat? Do I hear eggs? You, a steak might have 70 milligrams of cholesterol in a serving, and salmon might have 67, and an egg 360 to 420. So eggs are extremely rich in cholesterol. And that cholesterol, if it supersaturates, can form these crystals and break the plaque away. That's what we don't want, because that plaque then can plug an artery in our brain or our heart. Omega-3s and omega-6s work oppositely through thromboxanes to control the thickness of our blood and the constriction of our arteries. So we want our arteries to be reasonably open and not too constricted. That helps stop, if, if a, something obstructs the artery, that helps stop a clot from forming. We also want the bloodstream not to be too aggregatory. So we don't want it to stick together, not too much stickiness. And that also helps us not form a fatal clot or a brain clot in the bloodstream. So omega-3s are transformed in our bodies into EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, a formidable word. Eicosa just means 20, and it's 20 carbons long. And penta means five, and it has five double bonds. So this particular fatty acid can then be transformed into factors that reduce the clotting in the blood and open the arteries. Thromboxanes is one of the chief eicosanoids that do this. They also are transformed into anti-inflammatory leukotrienes. And these are really good too, because as I'll mention, inflammation is part of it. On the other hand, omega-6 fatty acids can contribute to constricted arteries and blood that clots more easily, both risk factors for a stroke or a heart attack. So we want to keep that balance about right. Now, one way to do it, um, using my diet doctor analysis tool, I've analyzed many common diets, you know, the standard American diet, the Atkins diet, and the others, and I found that you can really help uh, with that um, by, let me go back here, you can really help to balance your omega-3s and omega-6s that way. And I do prefer that people would make their own EPA in their body rather than taking it even from an algae source because these are the most fragile fatty acids in the world. And they're going to likely be rancid if they're taken externally. But if we make them in our bodies, then we'll make just enough and hopefully they won't be rancid. And I, there's a whole chapter in a book that I have on fats and oils. I didn't bring it today because it's a fat book and it's on fats. It's called Understanding Fats and Oils, a scientific guide to their health effects. If you want to learn all about fats and oils, my book is available on my website for $10. If you don't have $10, email me and I'll give you a copy. So I think it's important for us all to know more about fats and oils. Stopping diabetes, you know, diabetes is so misunderstood. People think it's all about sugars and fast-releasing carbohydrates, right? But there's a lot more to it because adult-onset diabetes, type 2, is really about insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is really caused mostly by saturated fat, excess saturated fat intake. On a diet high in saturated fats, cells have been found to have half the insulin receptors that they have on a low saturated fat diet. So right there, you've got half the insulin receptors. Also, the saturated fats interfere with the machinery inside the cell that the insulin will lock onto the insulin receptor external to the cell, internal to the cell, the insulin receptor substrate will lock on, but it won't if there are too many fats. So that leads to the glucose transporter not bringing glucose into the cell. And that's the simple way to put it. <laughs> so stopping diabetes, you need to eat less refined carbohydrates, obviously. More vegetables, fruits, beans, and nuts. Why? Because the damage in diabetes, as in so many diseases, is mediated through oxi oxidation. So by eating more antioxidants, you can lower the damage to the eyes, diabetic retinopathy, to the kidneys, 
you know, which leads to problems, and to the arteries, which can lead to amputations. So it's a really good idea to keep those antioxidants going. Diabetics need to be a little careful with their fruit. Berries are usually low glycemic load, and you can look at glycemic load, not glycemic index, to find out which fruits and berries are going to work well with that. Regular aerobic exercise really helps, and eating less animal fats from beef, pork, chicken, and cheese. Does that sound familiar? Did we just hear that? <laughs> Actually, less is putting it mildly. Um, I haven't had those things in 45 years, and I think that's probably a, you know, a healthier way to go. So losing extra weight, well, eating less animal fats and less junk food is obvious, and more vegetables, fruits, beans, and nuts helps. And of course, regular aerobic exercise helps. But even people who work out really hard, if they're eating a dozen donuts every day, they're not going to be able to lose weight. So here is 200 calories of cheese. Very easy to eat that much cheese. Here's 200 calories of beans, cooked beans. That's a full meal. And here's 200 calories of broccoli. That's really a full meal probably for two people. So try and eat nutrient-dense but energy-low foods if you're trying to drop off some weight to lower your risk of a stroke. This is a peaceful, quiet picture of boats at anchor to rest your eyes for a moment. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about some things you can do or you can recommend to relatives who want to reduce their risk of stroke but may not want to reduce their intake of meat and cheese and you know, other saturated fats from animals. One is increasing fresh fruits. This study found that if people ate two cups of fresh fruit a day versus very little fresh fruit a day, they lowered their risk of stroke by 32%. That's, that's a really nice, significant reduction in risk. You can also lower your risk with um, just some salads, but what a cool thing. I mean, just eat fruit, and fruit's delicious. So even your relatives who are total steak and potatoes guys, if you can get them to have a snack of fruit, and the trick with eating fruit is to put cut up pieces of bite-sized fruit next to the person, and they'll magically disappear. <laughs> Hello, David, welcome. Okay, you can reduce stroke risk with vegetables, specifically the cruciferous vegetables. Now, who's got a favorite cruciferous vegetable? Broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. These are loaded with wonderful, wonderful plant constituents that are really helpful. 33% less risk for people who ate one to two cups per day of cruciferous vegetables. Stroke was re reduced also 21% with more green leafy vegetables of any type and 25% less with just some, uh, one cup of citrus juice a day. So these are things that anyone can do to lower their stroke risk and raise your health. Now, what I, I work in a clinic loaded with, well, neurologists. They're med medical doctors who are neurologists. And their drugs often cause side effects. Well, there's side effects to this too, but they're all good. And that's the kind of side effects I like. What about nuts and seeds? 20% less risk if you just eat nuts or seeds once per day. Walnuts are the best nutritionally of the nuts because they have alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3, plant-based omega-3, and they also have the gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E, which is really good. You know, walnuts get left out of having a lot of vitamin E because most of the analysis programs just look for alpha tocopherol, which it has 0.7 milligrams in a serving of walnuts. But if you look at the total vitamin E, and it's mostly gamma tocopherol, you get 23 milligrams in a serving, which is a lot. So it, you really need to look at all the tocopherols to judge a nut or a seed to see how it's doing. Uh, salads reduce risk by 13%. A very large study done in the British Medical Journal. Now, whole grains are very helpful, too. I know that right now there's kind of a bit of a fad about gluten and grains all being really bad. But grains, if they're really whole and they're valuable grains, and perhaps not necessarily wheat, but many of the grains, quinoa, millet, 
rye, buckwheat. There's so many grains out there, and they have wonderful nutrition in them. Not quite as dense as vegetables or beans or nuts and seeds or fruit, but they still have good nutrients, and if you need some extra carbohydrates after a workout, they're a good way to fill it in. You can reduce stroke risk 65% with more fiber. 65% is a huge lowering of risk. And fiber is found, of course, only in plant-based foods, like fruit, vegetables, nuts, and beans. Fiber is not found in any animal products. Can you think of a couple other food types that there's no fiber at all in? Oil and sugar, none at all. And of course, very deficient in fiber would be most junk foods and white flour products. They're low in fiber. Fiber is what keeps us moving and lowers our risk of colorectal cancer. And it's a really good idea. You can kind of gauge the quality of a diet by how much fiber it has. I like for people to get 40 or 50 grams a day, at least, and, and more if it's all from whole plant foods. So that's a huge risk factor, 65% reduction. That's from an, a large Italian study in the clinical nutrition, 2013. White rice is a big factor. Now, white rice is found to increase your risk of diabetes, so that's going to contribute toward the risk of stroke. But this was pretty, it was a huge study in China, 63% lowering of risk. If you start adding up these percentages, you'll see that we've already reduced the risk of stroke about 90%, just with the ones I've mentioned in the last few slides. So you can really do a lot. Instead of white rice, why not eat brown rice? I know white rice tastes better, okay? I've, I try it once in a while, and it's really yummy. But it's devoid of nutrition. Well, not quite devoid, but it's a lot lower. Um, I wrote a college textbook for McGraw-Hill on vitamins and minerals. And in it, I studied the history of the B vitamins. Vitamin B1 thiamine was first discovered when they polished rice and took the B1 off of the rice, and the little kids in Japan got beriberi, which means it hurts, kind of sad. So we need to leave our grains alone and eat them as intact as possible, which means that flaked, shredded, puffed, and ground up are not nearly as helpful as the whole intact grain. If you're going to eat grains, you don't necessarily need to if you have a slow metabolism or you're trying to lose weight. But on the other hand, if you're working hard and need calories, you know, vegetables and fruits don't usually lend a lot of calories. Now, you want to reduce your stroke risk by 80%. They found in another large Chinese study that just one to two servings of soy products reduce stroke risk 80%. That's the biggest reduction in stroke risk that I've seen. Probably due in large part to genistein and diazdine, two wonderful polyphenols that are lowering inflammation in the body. And that lower inflammation helps to keep the arteries from becoming inflamed. And inflamed arteries are really a big part of the atherosclerotic plaque buildup. Now, I know there have been some talk from various websites about soy being unhealthy for people, and you've probably heard this because it was very well publicized and funded. We're not sure exactly who would fund uh, scare stories about soy that are untrue. Yes? The Weston Price, West Price Foundation, exactly. Um, anyway, they've been putting out the scare stories. You know, I collect scientific studies, like some people collect stamps or something. So I read medical journals, and I collect studies into folders. I have about 5,000 studies that I've selected as really excellent and put them in 200 folders. Well, one's called soy. And I am not being biased here, but there's really only extremely positive health benefits of soy. Now, we'd like it organic to avoid pesticides and GMO. And, but a lot of the studies were done, undoubtedly, on GMO soy, and even that has so many good properties that it overshadows some of the others. Yes? Right, good point. Um, she mentioned phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens are about a thousand times less potent than the estrogens in our bodies or the estrogens from cows, say in dairy milk. 
So when a breast receptor or a prostate receptor gets a phytoestrogen locked on it, that is an excellent thing because it blocks estrogen from that receptor, thus lowering our risk of cancer. One of the most convincing studies was one that showed women who had had breast cancer had surgery and looked at, did the cancer come back? And the women who were eating soy had a very greatly reduced risk of the cancer coming back compared to the women who didn't. The only negative aspect to soy, and it's common with many foods, is that it can be a goitrogen and cause thyroid problems if you're low in iodine. So I highly recommend that we all keep our iodine levels up. If we're eating fancy salt, we're not getting iodine that way. So we need to get some clean seaweed or some iodine and supplements somehow get our daily intake of iodine covered. Yes. So I, uh, Dr. Cousin said that um, soy is not a good food, that, that, that uh, some Japanese people did test studies. And then I heard elsewhere that, they, that it's OK to have soy food as long as it's not a prepared soy food. Like tofu was prepared and only something not prepared. Which ones would you suggest? Well, I've heard those rumors, but I can't find the evidence. And if you see any scientific study in a peer-reviewed journal that says that, please send it to me because I cannot find it. And I think it's fabricated. Do you think all kinds of soy are OK? Or I think that organic soy is a valuable food, but other beans are wonderful. Just like wheat is not the only grain, soy is not the only bean. And there's many wonderful beans out there. Enjoy them all. They're all really good for you. They'll reduce your risk of stroke probably better than soy because many of the colored beans, especially the, the brown and red ones, have a lot of carotenes and antioxidants in them. They rate very high on the antioxidant scales. So they're adding many other factors. It's just that soy is better researched is why we see this kind of giant study. And they wanted to make sure soy was helpful with stroke and an 80% reduction is the highest reduction I've seen for any food intervention to lower stroke risk. Yes? Genistein is a, I believe it's a flavone, flavonoid polyphenol. And it is very powerfully antioxidant and extremely excellent anti-inflammatory. So it's been found to help, for instance, with the inflammation in the brain and Alzheimer's disease and inflammation in arthritis in the joints and throughout the body. So, and that's found in soybeans, along with diazdine, which is hard to say or spell, and it's a really excellent one. One more question, and then we'll move on. Is that a problem with soy isolates? Yes, I think that when you get to textured vegetable protein, especially with the hexane residues, which are quite likely in the U.S., that I, I would probably not want to eat those. As far as making tofu, kind of one rule of processing is if you can make it in your kitchen, that's not too processed. You can make tofu in your kitchen. Uh, tempeh is, I think, an excellent form of soy, and the edamame green soybeans are an even better, more whole, less processed form. What about tea? It's interesting that both green and black tea and even coffee reduce stroke risk. Uh, 39 to 73 percent different, different studies are showing if you drink tea, then you can lower your risk. Now, I bet a lot of you are fans of Dr. Michael Greger, and uh, he loves green tea. You know, I would really like to drink green tea, but I'm already energized enough, and I don't need any more caffeine. So I'll just have to depend on the, all the other things. And of course, less meat. It's just so obvious that that reduces stroke risk, because meat has more saturated fat, than other foods, and in excess, of course, and then that's going to contribute to clogged arteries, and when a flap breaks off, that contributes to a stroke. Also, when you substitute, for instance, like in that China study on soy, it's not just that soy is helpful, but usually in a meal where you're eating something heavy like uh, tofu, you're not also going to eat steak or pork or poultry. So at that point, you're getting something anti-inflammatory and low in saturated fat instead of something inflammatory and high in saturated fat. So it's kind of a double benefit that way. I think I'll move along and maybe get questions at the end, because I know there's another lecturer coming in after me. One serving of soda pop raises your risk 16%. What about the people who drink a six-pack? Yeah, if you do the math, you'll see that it's really getting scary in there. The excess sugar in your bloodstream, in this cup, there's probably 
12 teaspoons of sugar. It can't all be absorbed right away, so your liver will pull it out of circulation and transform it into palmitic acid, one of the saturated fats, one of the three saturated fats that clog arteries. So that's, that's why these sugary drinks are doing it. Plus, there's no antioxidants in them, or very little. You now get a little break from the science. This makes me a little homesick, because this is Flat Rock Pool, and it's about a five-minute walk from our home. We live on an organic farm in Maui, and we get our power exclusively from the sun, and our water is all caught from the rain, and we grow a lot of avocados and bananas and papayas. And when I look at this cool waterfall, I get a little nostalgic, but a uh, couple weeks we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, you know, come on, visit all of you. Uh, it's avocado season, food's not a problem. What about supplements to reduce stroke risk? What does the science have to say about that? Vitamin C was very helpful. In a British medical journal study, they found that vitamin C in the diet and in plasma was found to reduce the risk of stroke by half. So people with higher vitamin C intakes and higher vitamin C in their plasma had half the risk of people with low levels. If you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, you might be able to get 400 milligrams of vitamin C every day. But that's really a lot. That's like a pretty much raw food diet where you're chomping vegetables and fruits all day long. I don't think you can do much higher than that by my analysis. How much vitamin C do we need? Interesting question. Because, see, most animals, the vast majority, make vitamin C in their livers through a four-step enzymatic process. Well, humans only have three of those four enzymes, so we can't make vitamin C in our bodies. But how much would we make if we could? Well, based on a 150-pound human, the various animals make something between 2,000 and 20,000 milligrams a day. And wild primates eat at least 1,200 milligrams per day from wild leaves and berries and fruits. Yes, Kat? Well, Kat's holding up a brain and body food, and in our clinical trial, we're using both food changes, which are very important, and supplements, and most of the supplements are in the brain and body food, which is like a multivitamin. In that, I put 1,200 milligrams of ascorbated vitamin C, and the difference is crucial that it's not ascorbic acid, but that is ascorbated, like calcium, magnesium, ascorbate. So I'd probably recommend you get at least 400, maybe up to 1,200 milligrams of ascorbated vitamin C every day, in addition to your diet, just for super optimum health. You said not, crucial that it's not ascorbate, but what? Ascorbic acid is pH 3, very acidic, irritates the stomach, is poorly absorbed. It has to meet up with a mineral, like a little singles club in the, in the intestine, to get absorbed. But the ascorbated, I know they sound alike, the ascorbated vitamin C is already linked with a mineral, ready for absorption, and that's the only way it's used in the bloodstream. Uh, it's on the screen. And it's very easy to absorb and very effective in being transported and being helpful. Ester C is part ascorbated, but not fully, so I don't recommend it because it's, you know, part good. <laughs> it's better than the worst, but not as good as the best. You said ascorbic acid is poorly absorbed in what else? It's acidic and irritates the stomach, especially in larger quantities, hence the upper limit. Okay, let's see, what about selenium? Anyone identify that nut? Yeah, Brazil nuts, they're high in selenium, also brown sesame seeds. I was analyzing my diet and my wife has a cookbook called Healthy Recipes for Friends and she made the sunflower seed gamazio from brown sesame seeds. And you know, where you, you just lightly warm it with a little salt and then you grind it up and put it on top of things. And my selenium was really high. So uh, that one day, because I ate so much of it because it was so good. But anyway, those are two good sources of selenium in the diet. Brazil nuts and brown sesame seeds, but not the white hulled ones. This study in BMC Neuroscience in 2012 showed that selenium protects neurons against low oxygen damage by reducing oxidative stress and reducing stress damage. Now, why? Because selenium is needed for glutathione peroxidase. And that's one of our enzymes that we use in our body that is so cool, it takes hydrogen peroxide in our body and turns it into water. 
very good trait. Hydrogen peroxide is very damaging, water's fine. So make sure you get enough selenium. It is a little tough. When I analyze diets, even my own, I don't every day get enough selenium. So I do put uh, selenium, and I mentioned selenomethionine as a good form, and 100 milligrams of that a day would be, oh, it's actually micrograms, a day would be a really good uh, idea. There are other minerals that also help with uh, our enzymes that detoxify free radicals, and that would be copper, zinc, and manganese. And we don't always get all of those every day, too, so I put those in the vitamins just to make sure. Okay, here's a fun one. Cacao, to reduce risk of stroke. I got two slides on this. Why? Because it tastes really good. Um, even a half ounce of stroke, a half ounce of cacao, reduced stroke 20%. And um, it helps with both the ischemic, the blocked artery strokes, and the hemorrhagic, the bleeding in the brain strokes. So, of course, you have to watch out for chocolate that has milk fat in it. And one, one nice trick on that is just look at the label for cholesterol, and if it's zero, okay, it's, that's fine. That means no milk fat. Uh, I prefer to eat the dark chocolate with less milk fat. Now, if you get too much chocolate in your diet, it will raise your saturated fat levels some. And so you have to be a little bit careful not to overdo it. Uh, maybe an ounce or two would be perfectly safe, though. There is saturated fat, actually, the more bitter you go, less sugar, but more saturated Right, there's saturated fat in chocolate, so just one or two ounces is probably about the right amount. Um, even a half an ounce in these studies were showing a reduced risk of stroke, though. So green tea contains epigallocatechin gallate, a wonderful substance, it's polyphenol, that reduces the risk of stroke. And a Japanese study found that Drinking green tea or coffee lowered stroke risk 20%. So you could perhaps, since if you don't like caffeine, you could get this as a substance in a supplement, and then you would get the antioxidant without the caffeine. It's something that I should probably do. Resveratrol from grapes is well known. Uh, probably one of the reasons why a little bit of red wine has gotten such good press. Probably a good advertising budget is another reason. In this study in um, the American Chemical Society, Chemical Neuroscience 2013, resveratrol reduced oxidation, inflammation, and brain cell death during stroke. So this is saying that even if you get a stroke, it might be a smaller one instead of a bigger one if you're eating lots of grapes. And grapes also have proanthocyanidins, which are extremely helpful with Alzheimer's disease. They go into the brain, into the memory areas, and guard it against inflammation and oxidation. So grapes are good, yes. Well, I think taking resveratrol supplement is not going to be nearly as tasty or juicy as the grapes themselves. So, and especially if you get organic grapes, since they spray right on the grapes themselves, if you could get a lot of organic grapes and eat those, it would be optimal. Um, as long as you're not diabetic, then you would need to cut back on them a little bit. It is possible to get resveratrol in a supplement form, and I think it's still helpful. Yeah, raisins would be also good. Um, the golden raisin's not quite as good. In the back? Red wine. Red wine. Well, if you, if you like red wine, um, you could drink it, but I would challenge anyone who's drinking red wine to try a little experiment. Okay, go ahead and get a bunch of red grapes and run them through a juicer and put it in a wine glass and drink it. And see if you don't like the high better than the wine high. And if you do, you'll be a big step ahead. So just try it. If you don't like it, keep drinking the wine. Yes? Does it matter if the grapes have seeds? If what? Does it matter if the grapes have seeds? Did anyone hear that? Yes. Oh, does it matter if the grapes have seeds? I'm sorry, kind of echoey in here. Um, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, the studies are on both seedless and seeded grapes, so probably not that much. Are grapes too high in the glycemic range or is grape ripe? As I mentioned, if you're a diabetic, you need to restrict your grape intake. Absolutely. So they not only protected the brain from damage, but also reduced inflammatory changes and oxidative stress, which are the mediators of damage during a stroke. So 
Grapes in any form would be a great idea. A lot of fruits are good, though. Berries are good, too. Now, what about after a stroke? Some supplements can be really good. Even tiny strokes can happen all the time. There's something called vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is very, very common and almost always coexistent with Alzheimer's disease. Vascular dementia is where you have clogged arteries in the brain, restricted blood flow to the brain, but also little tiny strokes that might wipe out a tiny area of memory. Sometimes they're too small to even see on an MRI, but they happen and they happen and they happen and they contribute to damage in the brain. So it's a really good idea to not have vascular dementia. And what do you think the best way to not have vascular dementia is? Well, that would be avoiding beef and pork and chicken and cheese. Um, vitamin D, reduce the size of stroke and brain damage. Now, I was raised in San Francisco, and um, I didn't get much vitamin D. And you probably aren't getting enough either, because it's a foggy city. You've got to love it, but it's a bit foggy. I think vitamin D might be a good idea in light of this research that vitamin D levels were linked to less behavior impairment after a stroke. And that's something none of us want, is behavior impairment. Also, vitamin D increase, decreased... Does that say increased? I'm sorry, that's, that slide should say decreased stroke risk by 25%. Uh, in the Honolulu Heart Study... <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to change that one. Okay, good. I'm glad I don't have to change that slide. <laughs> so we don't want low vitamin D, uh, so it would be a really good idea to take some vitamin D. I put 1,000 IUs in my brain and body food because it's a Hawaiian study. But if you were to take that here, I'd probably recommend that you add one to 3,000 per day of vitamin D3, you can get it, the uh, vegan form of vitamin D3. D3 is more effective than vitamin D2, ergo calciferol. It's made from a radiated fungus. And vitamin D, cholecalciferol, is the kind we make in our bodies from sunlight. But we all know San Francisco, sunlight's a little hard to get. I went to Lincoln High, and if it ever got to 85 degrees, school was out. That happened twice. <laughs> it just, you know, in the avenues, it doesn't get very warm. Carotenoids really help after stroke inflammation. Carotenoids are wonderful fat soluble antioxidants. They're found in yellow and orange fruits and vegetables and also in green fruits and vegetables. The chlorophyll hides the color, but it's still there. Carotenoids can be, some of them are carotenes and can be made into vitamin A, retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid, retinal palmitate. But all of them are powerfully antioxidant and being fat soluble, they're very protective to the brain, specifically for strokes. This study showed that they relieve oxidative stress and lower inflammation in cerebrospinal fluid. Very recent study. Carotenoids like lycopene, lutein, alpha and beta carotene were lower and oxidation was higher right after people had strokes. So that's a real link. We want to make sure our carotenoid levels are high and it's wonderfully easy to get carotenoids, just eat lots of fruits and vegetables and make a rainbow of color on your plate. Proanthocyanidins are often commercially obtained from these marine pine bark trees. And proanthocyanidins are also found to be very helpful to decrease inflammation, especially C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor and increased production of anti-inflammatory cytokines. So this is something that you would take as a supplement. I would recommend this more to people who've had a stroke and are trying to prevent another one or prevent damage from another one, rather than someone who is still healthy and doesn't really need it. Now, we've all heard about turmeric. Turmeric's a wonderful plant. It grows in Maui, and the, the root looks a lot like ginger. It's in the same family, but a little darker color. Turmeric. The curcuminoids in turmeric are hard to absorb. They're fat soluble. And so when you take a one gram capsule of turmeric, very little gets absorbed. Studies are showing like a few nanograms get into your bloodstream. There's very, very little. So my recommendation for turmeric for anti-inflammatory joints and brain and everywhere else 
would be to make a curry. And we like breadfruit curry in Hawaii, but you can make any kind you like here. And put in a few tablespoons of curry and some black pepper, because the piperin in black pepper helps absorption. So instead of one gram, you're getting many grams, and it's delicious and forms a meal too. So that's how I'd recommend getting the turmeric. Turmeric helped problems by hemorrhagic stroke as well as ischemic stroke, and it helped um, reduce neuroinflammation and neurovascular injury, significantly improving neurological outcome from the Journal of Neurosurgery, 2011. It reduced problems after ischemic stroke, reduced the incidence of ischemic stroke. It's just plain good for you. And, you know, a nice way to do it is to slice the fresh root and use that like ginger. You can fry it up with onions, and that way you can get a lot of turmeric inside you. And, of course, people from India and in the Ayurvedic traditions know all about turmeric as its healing properties. It's widely used in curry sauce. Bos Boswellia is used for arthritis and could be the most effective plant for arthritis. And that's because it lowers inflammation. The insensol isolated from Boswellia resin is a major anti-inflammatory agent, inhibited nuclear transcription factor kappa B activation and assisted with stroke reperfusion injury. So when you have a stroke, a small stroke, a lot of time the artery will plug and then it will unplug. When it unplugs, a rush of oxygenated blood will then go to the area and cause a lot of damage. That's called reperfusion injury. So it is important that you have some protection from this if you're at high risk for a stroke. And if you have high risk for a stroke and arthritis, then Boswellia is going to match in a couple of ways. As I mentioned, it's good after a stroke. Now, coenzyme Q10 is something we're using in our dementia trial, trying to stop dementia with diet. Coenzyme Q10 is made in every cell in your body, unless you're on statin drugs. And then you get about a 40% reduction in coenzyme Q10. And that's one of the problems. Coenzyme Q10 is the only fat-soluble antioxidant made inside the human body, and it's essential for energy production. You simply can't make energy in a mitochondria without this stuff. It's part of the electron transport chain. So you can take it as a supplement, and it seems extremely safe. So that's one thing that you can do to boost your antioxidant levels, and we're doing that in our clinical trial. It reduced cell death after an ischemic stroke in this study, and especially reduced cell death in memory areas. So that's, that's a real good thing. And of course, if you are on statins, you might consider lowering your cholesterol with diet rather than statins. And the best way to do that is to just go ahead and get your cholesterol so low with diet that your doctor takes a look at your cholesterol and says, you don't need your statins anymore. And that's the best, or maybe you cut the dose in half and then you can keep going like that. But better not to stop drugs without checking with a doctor or a pharmacist because there could be consequences to a rapid reduction in a drug. Now, who's heard of alpha-lipoic acid? Alpha-lipoic acid is a wonderful antioxidant substance that recharges our other antioxidant substances. So it's also been found to help with stroke and after stroke. It uh, helps the brain neurons after a stroke. So here are the risk factors that you can control. You can lower high blood pressure, which raises your risk six times of a stroke. And you all know how to do that. Exercise figures in very well, remember the flax, and of course, less saturated fat from meat and cheese and so on. That also lowers your cholesterol and your heart disease. Lowering diabetes is also related very much to saturated fat intake, as well as sugars and rapidly absorbing carbohydrates. Lowering body fat is good to lower your risk. Here's that uh, 200 calories of avocado is looking better and better. I think we all know that smoking increases your risk. Well, I think we are um, just have time for a few questions. You've been a very patient audience, and I want to thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share my research with you. That's my passion. Yes?
okay, raw as opposed to cooked fruits and vegetables. Well, I think with fruit, it's obvious, eat them raw, always. Uh, with vegetables, well, you know, you can actually get a lot more, let's say a cup of kale that's raw might have about 100 milligrams of calcium, but a cup of cooked kale has almost 500 milligrams of calcium, just because it weighs five times as much. Okay, it's nothing magical about it. So as far as minerals go, they're preserved through the cooking process as long as you're not boiling and throwing away the water. I, my personal opinion is that we should definitely eat some raw food every day, and in a climate like this, you might want to eat some cooked food just for comfort. Oh, and, you know, there's so many wonderful cooked foods. Catherine. Did you want me to tell about a couple of the books you have written? Okay, let me pass you the mic. Okay. Can I ask another Yeah, we'll have questions in a sec. The book that's closest to the stroke uh, talk, How to Not Get a Stroke, is No More Heart Attacks. And I think we have to How are we doing for time? So, um, that's oh, yeah? similar yeah. information. <laughs> Uh, we have arthritis relief on reducing inflammation by Dr. Steve Blake. A nutritional approach to Alzheimer's disease, excellent book, very scientific. A way out of the trouble of Alzheimer's disease, at least the vascular dementia side of it. Healing medicine, how to live your life without needing medical intervention, covering the four foundations of health. Healthy recipes for friends is raw vegan and no saturated fat, very, very low saturated fat, so you won't be cholesterol. You won't be building cholesterol. <laughs> cholesterol. Cholesterol. <laughs> okay. I tested those recipes, they're really good. Cooking for brain power, a little small but mighty book on how to prevent dementia. We have this available for that Hawaii dementia prevention trial that we're doing. Catherine is giving those to all of our participants. Voluntarily. Yeah. Then we have about 13 movies uh, of different subjects, and then The Diet Doctor, which is a nutritional software for analyzing your own nutrition. You can be your own nutritionist and find out if you're getting enough, too much, or not enough of certain nutrients by entering in what you ate. Our uh, supplements, the brain and body food, the highest quality to help prevent the dementia and stroke. And last but not least, New York Doctors, which is software about medicinal plants from around the world. This is a huge encyclopedia, even though it's really lightweight. So uh, <laughs> herbal medicine, this is great. Thank you, Steve. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, good news. We have time for a few questions. Yes, sir. Are the red and brown beans? Brown beans. Yes. Are beneficial like soya beans? Yes. Um, other beans are also wonderful. And we shouldn't... It, the only reason why a lot of people eat soy is because tofu and tempeh are so tasty and easy. But you can also eat the other beans. If you have a crock pot, for instance, those of you who are not on solar power get to use a crock pot. And you can just throw the beans in and eat them later and try different types all the time. They're, they're wonderful and every bit as good as soy. Some are better. Yes? How do you get Boswellia for arthritis? If you wanted to get Boswellia for arthritis, you could go to any natural food store um, I, and select a brand that's um, well known and so you're sure it really has Boswellia in it. Uh, it's a resin from a tree known as frankincense. Yes? She's asking if coffee is acidic to the body. I feel the same way. Um, coffee has some studies showing some antioxidant effect, although not a huge one. Some studies showing more pancreatic cancer. Um, coffee is so commonly drunk in the U.S. If you are going to drink coffee, though, I'd recommend organic coffee because it's grown in the tropics with lots of pesticides, a whole list of pesticides. So much better to get it organic. Yes. Are there various other kinds of vitamin C or just the ascorbic that you prefer? 
Okay, well, I'll answer about the vitamin C. There's ascorbic acid, which is found in 99% of the supplements, which is the cheap form that's poorly absorbed and irritating. The and good form. Which is the good form? The good form is the ascorbate, the mineral ascorbate, and it's very hard to find. I had to look to include it in my vitamins. And if you can't it's, find it, if you can't find it, you go ahead. You, Okay, you're asking about essential tremors, and I'm sorry, but I haven't yet researched essential tremors. I talked to our Parkinson's expert neurologist, and she said, oh, there's nothing you can do about it, but I'll bet I can find something, and I will look. Time? Well, it's been really wonderful, and if you have questions, we have a thank you. We have a few minutes. I'll be over at the table here. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.